Amen. Now, how many of you this morning um, have, actually, I need the little clicker, so Matt, if we can get the clicker, I don't know where it is. Um, how many of you have ever looked at the concentric circles on a tree trunk when it's sawn in half? Okay. Um, if you look at the picture that's going to come up, Susie, will you put the picture of the concentric circles? If you look at this picture, you'll get an idea of what I'm talking about. How many of you have seen that? Okay, yeah. My daughter's wedding, at my daughter Renee and Ruben's wedding, they, they put these things on the table, and I've sort of highlighted the concentric circles. I've exaggerated them a bit. But this is what I'm talking about, these concentric circles. You can tell how old a tree is. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Caleb. You can tell how old a tree is by, well, the experts can tell, we can't, you know, by the diameter of the trunk and then by the number of concentric circles and by the distance between each one of them. And experts will tell you how old the tree is. And some trees are, are hundreds of years old and some trees are even thousands of years old. When we were in Israel, um, they pointed out this olive tree in the Garden of Gethsemane. They told us this tree dates back to the time of Jesus Christ. That's how old that tree is. So the, the concentric circles represent a time when that circle was the trunk. That circle was the trunk. It was the contact point without a reality. It, it was the, the place, for example, this one, at one time was the bark and was the contact point with the weather, the seasons, the changing times. And then eventually the tree grew and, and many years later, it just became another concentric circle. No longer the bark, now the bark is out there. And so it's amazing to see, you know, how that happens. But, you know, we're not talking about trees this morning. We're talking about the church. And much like those rings, we have had Christians in different times and in different eras who were the contact point with reality. They were the generation that was rubbing shoulders with the elements. They were the ones exposed to the seasons. And, and it's really thanks to those generations, those past generations, that the tree called the church arrived today that we're here today. It's, it's thanks to them that, that they, they did a good job by passing the torch of faith onto a new generation that we are here today. And we are now the bark. We are now the ones facing the elements. We are now the ones weathering the storms. We are now the generation that's the contact point with reality. And as I've been thinking about that, I've been thinking that COVID-19 to expose many flaws, many fragilities, many failures within the current church. And I've been asking myself, um, will we survive? Will we be strong enough to pass on to the next generation what has been passed on to us? And, and what kind of church, what kind of faith, what kind of legacy are we now going to pass on to the new generation? You see, at first when COVID arrived, everyone was surprised, everyone was supercharged, and everyone was super happy. We were now confined to our homes. And people were like, yeah, I don't have to go to work. <laughs> and then people were like, wow, I don't have to go to church. I can stay at home in the comfort of my home. So families would gather around in their PJs, sipping coffee, and joining their church on the television screen or on the computer. And it was so cool. So we had Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Right Now Media, and all of other social media platforms all of a sudden full with Christian content, and Christians could, in the comfort of their own home, enjoy church. And churches around the world began immediately broadcasting their services to this virtual audience. And at first, people loved it. At first, people said, this is the church. This is church. And many began to defend, this is the future. This is how it's always going to be. But my question this morning to you is, is this really church? Is a bunch of people sitting around in their pajamas, sipping coffee on a Sunday morning, watching, tell, uh, watching a service on a screen and praising online, is that church? But then I want to ask you to pause and rewind. Is church what we had before COVID-19? 
is that church. Is church people coming to church, to a building, once on a Sunday to praise and worship the Lord for 40 minutes and then to listen to a preaching, a good one or a bad one, whatever, for another 30, 40 minutes? And, and maybe some people even went a step further. They not only went to church once a Sunday, but they also went to a weekly life group. And they spent another couple of times together in a weekly life group. Is that church? I must tell you, I think not. I think we have missed the point of what church is altogether. I think that the true nature and the true essence of the church is not what we have now during COVID, but it's also not what we had before COVID. That's not what Jesus intended. Some people keep saying to me, Pastor Eddie, I can't wait for things to get back to normal again so we can have normal church. But is our aspiration to get back to the building and do what we were doing before, is that our goal? Is our goal a a two-hour service on a Sunday plus another two hours during a weekly life group, is that what we think is church? I want to emphatically tell you this morning that I've been studying the Bible for 36 years now, and I'm convinced that church is far, far more than that. Church is something that I think none of us has really begun to experience yet. Church, in God's eyes, is a far more glorious experience, a far more glorious organism than we've ever known before. So I've been wrestling a lot with this thing of what is church? What is church all about? And while on this summer holiday, I was down in the Algarve, and Renee and Ruben invited us to go and meet some of their friends, their former pastors from the UK, and we went and hung out with Pastor John Thompson, probably watching us this morning, if he services later on. And and he told me, you know, Pastor Eddie, we're wrestling with the same thing in the UK. What is church? And and, and as I've traveled around, I've been hearing other pastors say the same thing. We're all struggling with this thing that's called church, especially because COVID has made us face a new reality. COVID has changed everything. And it's challenged pastors everywhere. And, and, And it's challenged everything that we've taken for granted as being the church. So then John shared with me a series of messages by a guy called Pastor Dan Sheed out of Australia. And and I listened to that and I thought, that's what we need. And so I piggybacked on his series and and I changed our series that I planned months ago and I changed it. We were talking about marriage and relationships this season. We've postponed it. And I've titled this series, What is Church? A glorious vision unpacked, and it's based on the book of Ephesians. You see, my friends, I want more. I see church entirely different to what we have, and I see it entirely different to what we had before. You know, church is something that I think is summed up by Eugene Peterson. You probably know the name. He's the guy who did the message paraphrase of the Bible. And Eugene Peterson says this, Church is an appointed gathering of named people in particular places who practice a life of resurrection in a world in which death gets the biggest headlines. I think Eugene Peterson put the ball right out of the park, Santa, with that one. I think he hit a home run. I mean, that is a spectacular definition. Imagine if we advertised Riverside like this. Welcome to Riverside. We are a group of people who are living the resurrection life of Jesus in the land of the dying. What a spectacular definition. Wow. We believers are a group of people gathered together, known, named, and identified by God. We are living this new life of Jesus as born again people of God. And we are doing that in a world where people are moaning and hurting and helpless and hopeless and groaning and dying. I challenge you in this series to think of yourself as part of those who are known and named by God. Known and named by God. And and think of yourself as the bark. 
You are the generation. I am the generation who now has the enormous responsibility, privilege, and joy of transmitting to the next generation, to our children and our children's children, this thing called faith in Christ Jesus, this thing called the church, this thing called the community of believers. You see, and so we're going to use this, this amazing book called the Epistle to the Ephesians or the Letter to the Ephesians, written by the Apostle Paul, because that book paints a glorious picture of this thing called the church. And every other letter that Paul wrote, he wrote to answer a question. He wrote to correct a doctrine. He wrote to exhort. He wrote to discipline. He wrote because there was a problem. But Ephesians is not such a letter. Ephesians is unique in all of his epistles. In Ephesians, he wanted to describe a glorious community of people. And I think the crux of the book is Ephesians 4.1. Listen to this. Ephesians 4.1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. You know, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. What's he saying? This is what we call one of the prison epistles. He wrote this letter while he was a prisoner, while he had been imprisoned by Rome. And, and his big message, his 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 message in this entire book can be summed up to this. He's saying, live lives that are worthy of the calling. He's telling us, you have been called. And when he says you, he's not saying you singular. He's saying you plural. He's talking to the church. He's writing actually to several churches in the entire region of Ephesus. And he's saying, we folks, we need to live a life that's worthy of the calling of the one who called us. And my question to you and to me today is, are we living such a life? Are you and I truly worthy of this calling that God has given us in Christ Jesus? Are we satisfied with the way we are being the church today? Are we happy with our lives? I'm not. I believe the church is so much, much more than what we have today. I believe the church should be impacting society so much more than it is I believe we should be seeing people saved every day. I believe we should be seeing miracles take place every day. I believe our families should so be living the gospel that our children grow up in the knowledge and the wisdom of God and that our children don't go astray and that our family impacts the family next door and the families in the neighborhood because of what they look in us and they say, wow, what have you guys got that's so different? So as we will see in the coming weeks, the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul unpacks this glorious, glorious and beautiful vision of the church. And then in the final three chapters of Ephesians, he, he unpacks how we can live that on a very practical, everyday basis. So today we begin this series, and God wants you to know by Paul's letter to the Ephesians that God has placed a calling on your life. There is a specific calling on every life in this place. God wants you to know that you are, the, you are the bark. You are the contact point with reality. You are the one responsible today to change the world and impact this generation. Are we worthy? Are we worthy of this legacy of this call that has been passed on to us? Are we fulfilling our destiny? Not only as individuals, but as a community, as Riverside International Church. We thank God that we've planted other churches, and now there's a riverside in Porto, there's a riverside in Coimbra, there's a riverside in Ordi Valles, there's a riverside in Lisbon, there's a riverside in the Algarve. We thank God for that. We're extending our reach. But is that, are we happy with that, or do we aspire to more? So in this series, we're going to unpack this epistle, and I'm going to challenge you to do something. Don't listen to the podcast. Don't read the great books about it. Don't study the good sermons that are out there. Let's not rely on the teachings of men. I want to uh, challenge you today to pick up the Bible and to read for 15 minutes every day. Just read. Read the book of Ephesians. Reread the book of Ephesians. Read it in a version. Read it in another version. Use different translations. If you understand different language, read it. Meditate on it day and night and try to grasp the glorious vision that God has given us about what is church. And, and more important, what is my part as part of the church? Now, I'd like you to imagine something with me for the next couple of seconds. Imagine a world 
without Christianity as we know it. Imagine a world like that. No church buildings, no cathedrals, no parishes, no New Testament, no Christian television or radio, nothing about Christ on social media anywhere. In fact, no television, no radio, no internet point whatsoever. Imagine a world without all of the trappings that you and I have become accustomed to as to thinking that's Christianity. Imagine that world. If you can imagine that world, then you are imagining the world the Ephesian believers lived in. That was their world. Then along one day came a man called Paul, formerly Saul. He ministered there, the Bible says, for about three years. And during those three years, many people converted to the Lord Jesus Christ. They surrendered their hearts to Jesus. And, and each of those people began to meet together in homes from house to house. Six, eight, 10, 12, 15 people meeting in different homes. In the Greek language, we call those the oikos. When Paul eventually left Ephesus, he called a young man called Timothy, his protege, to continue the work and to structure those churches in Ephesus. And then occasionally, preachers and teachers would come through the region of Ephesus and they would visit those pockets of believers to instruct them, to equip them, to, to train them up in the word of God. And so all these teachers would be coming through and, and helping them to grow in their faith. So for Ephesians, for the people of Ephesus, this was church. It had no formal structure. People were meeting from house to house. They longed for the teaching of the apostles. They sang praises to God together. They ate together and they shared all of their resources so there was no need among them like we read in the book of Acts. And all over Asia Minor, churches like these began to blossom everywhere throughout the Roman Empire. And like I told you some weeks ago, I visited uh, um, Troia. And if you go to Conimbriga today, you will see there was a Christian presence even here in Portugal, not called Portugal back then. But on the extreme point of the Iberian Peninsula, small Christian communities had come as far as here, meeting together from house to house. So these, these believers in these house churches were, were, were so excited. We are the church, they were saying. You know, we are the church of Christ, called out of our pagan ways, and now we are together. But I think they must have been sad. Their founder was gone. The guy who had established them in their faith, their spiritual father had left. They missed his wisdom. They missed his knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. They missed the things that the Spirit of God revealed to him about all Jesus Christ said and did, and they must have been sad. But now think about this. Imagine one day they were gathered together in these different houses, and someone came to the door of one house that day, and he knocked on the door, and he says, I have a letter from the Apostle Paul. Wow. These letters, these epistles we call them, that you have in your New Testament, they, they were circulatory letters. They were sent from place to place. They were sent to the region of Corinth, to the region of Ephesus, to the region of Philippi, to the region of Thessalonica. And the apostles, Peter, James, and others, would be writing these letters to encourage the body of believers now spread all over the world, telling them either correcting a wrong or giving them further instruction, or in this case, talking about the church. So imagine on that day that you were gathered in your house church in Ephesus, all of a sudden somebody locks on the door and they say they have a letter from Paul and, and you excitedly open this letter and you say, well, it's not even, it's not a book like you know, it's a parchment, it's a scroll. And they open it and, and, and all of a sudden you read these words, Ephesians 1, 1, 2. Of course, it wasn't 1, 1, 2, it was just a letter. It didn't have chapters and verses. We did that much later. It was just a letter, but the letter begins like this. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, to beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And, and, or rather, that's not the verse. Sorry, that's, no, that's not the verse either. Where's the verse? I'll tell you what the verse is. That's Ephesians 4, okay? The verse is this, Ephesians 1, 1 and 2. I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine what those believers must have felt when they read these opening words. 
These are the words that come from our spiritual father. These are the words from our founder, from the apostle to the Gentiles. You see, Paul was well known to people everywhere. He was the church planter. He was the guy who did three major missionary journeys and went outside of Jerusalem and took the gospel into Asia and into Europe. And wherever he went, he planted these churches. He was a prophet. He was an evangelist. He was an author. He was a missionary. He was a teacher. You know, mighty Rome feared this guy because wherever he went, he just converted people left, right, and center. But I think most of all, the people in Ephesus had a strong link to them because for most of them, he was the guy who led them out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. He was their spiritual father. And he begins his words by saying, I am writing to you, God's holy people, to those set apart, to the saints of God. Let me ask you a question. If I called you a saint today, what would you say? You probably would answer me immediately, I ain't no saint, right? Because commonly most of us think of this word saint coming from the Roman Catholic legacy probably. We think of, of people who were, wow, amazing, almost perfect and spotless in history and risen almost deified to this position, exalted. And we think of them as saints. But if you're a Protestant, you probably don't have that frame of reference, but you have the frame of reference that I'm just a flawed guy. I'm just, I'm just a, a girl that messes up. You know, I, I'm just no saint. You know, you, you, you probably think like the Ephesians when they heard these words. The Ephesians were probably saying, yeah, we know Abraham. We've heard now of Moses. We've heard of David. We've heard of these amazing people in history. Uh, we've even heard of the Apostle Paul, the mega superstar of our time. You know, and, and they're saints. But we're no saints. We're not saints. That's not me. But Paul, I think, used this wording very, very intentionally. These are not words that they just get thrown out there. These are words guided by the Holy Spirit. And Paul was very in intentional. And he was saying to them, I am calling you saints, not because of anything you have done, but because what Christ has done for you. I am addressing you as saints. As this famous theologian N.T. Wright said, N.T. Wright said these words. So, oops, sorry. Okay. N.T. Wright, famous theologian in England. In the New Testament, every single Christian is referred to as a saint, including the muddled and sinful ones to whom Paul wrote his letters. They are not designated this simply because they are living a holy life in the present, but because they have left behind the realm of darkness and have entered into the kingdom of light. Right, rightfully, excuse the pun, concludes that we are saints, not because of what we do, but because you and I chose to leave behind the kingdom of darkness and to join the kingdom of light. And the light of our leader, the light of our Lord now shines on our life. And it doesn't matter what people say about us. It doesn't matter what they write about it. It doesn't matter what they accuse us of. I am a saint in Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's who I am. That's my identity. I am a called and chosen one of God. You see, that's what the word means. This word saint significates, significa. wow, that was a good one. I've never done that before. Went into Portuguese right there. This word saint means I've been separated. I've been set apart. I'm holy, separated unto God. I'm no longer part of the world. I'm now part of this thing that Jesus Christ came to start that's called the body of Christ on earth the bride of Christ, the ecclesia, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who I am. Amen? So daily, what is my will? What is my desire? What is my passion? What is my purpose? I want to fulfill the plan of him who called me, of whom who separated me. That's what I want to do with my life. And to those called and separated, Paul wrote these words. To the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine those words. Imagine you're in that house church and all of a sudden you receive these two amazing gifts that Paul gives you. Grace and peace be upon you. Grace, the unmerited favor of Christ. You don't deserve it. It's the mercy and the goodness of God poured out on you and on your life and on your family. Grace to you. And then he says, and peace. That wonderful Hebrew word, shalom, peace. You know, I'm sure that at that time when he was writing this, the Roman Empire had begun to intensify the persecution on the believers. And and people were being mocked. People were being ostracized. People were being ridiculed. People were being persecuted. They were afraid. They were insecure. They were unsettled. They were worried about their future, knowing what was being done. You know, the apostles would be dragged off and were being killed. The leaders of the church were being persecuted. The church was being persecuted. Then along comes a letter from your founder in the midst of this very troubling time, and he says, be at peace. Be at peace. Receive the peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Be at peace. And then he goes on to describe some of the glorious things that we're going to hear in the coming weeks. He's going to go on and describe how amazing this community is. And everything he says, the words are simply glorious, beautiful, amazing. And that's what we're going to be talking to you about in the coming weeks. Now, folks, that which he describes in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to unpack, that's what I want to be a part of. That's the church I want to be a part of. That's the church I want to pass on to my grandchildren. I worry for the future for them. It's tough enough living in our day today as we see it, but it's becoming worse and worse and worse. You know, we took the young, the young people from, from our church And we had a nice group of them who came out to Tim's garage and we said, just ask questions. Express your doubts. Share what's on your mind. And I'm telling you, we talked about everything. We talked, they asked questions, you know, from creation to abortion. They asked it all. And they unpacked their hearts. And then some of them began to describe, you know, I'm 13, but the guy in my class, he's gender fluid. The other one is, is bi. You're 13. Yeah, but he's bi and he's depressed and he's suicidal. He's bi and he's depressed and suicidal. You see, the things that the educational system is now teaching them is completely contrary to anything that we're teaching them here. And so these kids are troubled. They don't know how to deal with this. That's the world we're growing up in. And, and, and imagine the world when, when my grandchildren are 16 or 17. Imagine that world. So I think, folks, that Church has to be far more than ritual, tradition, religion. It's got to be more than that. We've got to be able to pass on to our young people, to this new generation, something that so excites them that they say, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of what my vovo is part of. I want to be part of what Glammy is part of. That's what I want to be a part of. That's the community. That's the community I grew up in, and I know that's genuine. I know that's authentic. I know that's real. I know that that's what I want with all my heart. That's where love exists. That's where God moves. That's where things happen. That's what I want. Do you want that? Folks, church is far more than living with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Far more than that. Church is far more than a weekly experience we come to on a Sunday. Church is far more than an experience on Sunday and another experience during the week. And then we get on with our lives on normal. Church is something that should impact every second of your life. Not every minute, every second. Where you know you're a part of a community that's known by God, called by God, separated unto God to do the will of God. That's what church is. You are a saint like I am a saint. And if you are a saint, you want more. Because there's something inside of you saying, this is not enough. I'm not happy with this. This is not what I was made for. This is not what I was called for. Something deep inside of you must be saying, if you are a saint, there is more, so much more. I want so much more. I want to see what the New Testament church saw. 
I, I want to walk past the cripple in my shadow and immediately they get healed. That's what I want. I, I want people to, to look at us and, and, and come to us and say, give me what you have. Give me what you have. I need that. You know, I'm broken. I want my marriage to be like yours. That's what I want more than anything. I want my marriage to reflect your marriage. How did you get that? And we can tell them, Jesus, Jesus, not about me at all. So I want to conclude with this belief. Listen to this. This is my concluding remark. I am convinced that a time is fast approaching when we, like the Ephesians, are going to be persecuted, mocked, ostracized, ridiculed for our faith. And may we, like the Ephesians, choose to be saints, separated unto God, and may His grace and His peace inundate our hearts in the most troubling of times, and may we be the bark, may we be the outer point of reality with Him the world contacts, and may they look at us and say, that's the church. That's what I want to be a part of. So as our band comes now to lead us in worship, and as we praise the Lord, I want to challenge you, keep coming back for the next six weeks and come and listen to this amazing thing called the church. Read about it. Study it at home. And let's together decide, you and I, we're different. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We belong to this amazing thing called the body of Christ, the fellowship of believers, the called ones, the saints of God. That's who we are. Let's worship Katya. Amen. Amen.